very excited to have you all here today. Um, we excited, decided to experiment with uh, our first ever product talk last quarter. Uh, for those of you who were here, then you know it was just a smashing success. Um, lots and lots of questions, um, lots of fun things to share. And so we wanted to, to bring it back for um, product talk two. And we will also continue to do these the rest of the year and hopefully uh, beyond. Um, so thanks all for, for being here again today. Uh, really the goal is to, to share uh, news of recently launched features and um, features that we're working on now and are aware of in our roadmap. And then probably the most exciting uh, portion of the event is when you all ask uh, lots and lots of questions of our amazing PMs. And uh, I think last time JH answered like 12 questions in seven minutes, which was pretty impressive. Um, High quality answers. <laughs> I mean, they were pretty good, I was impressed. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, me slash us, I'm Tucker Hutchinson. I'm our VP of Revenue here at UI. Um, and I'm going to kick it over uh, to my colleagues to uh, take it away. Cool. Um, so anyway, I'll talk to the agenda here. So we're going to do a couple of high-level updates just on the team and company and what's been happening in user interviews. Um, Brittany will take us through some of our favorite um, new updates that we've released recently. And then I'll cover the other PMs, what we're building now, and um, give you some, some visibility into what's coming next. And then we'll save a good chunk of time at the end for uh, any Q&A. So that's basically the agenda. Um, go from there. So we did want to start with just user specific stuff. Um, as many of you may be aware, we, uh, we raised a Series A um, a little while back. And so the exact date, which has been very exciting for us. And so we've been able to grow the team quite a bit and, and take on a lot of new projects. And so you can a lot of the faces on the slide also in Zoom right now. Um, so you can see that we've grown the PM team quite a bit. And so uh, we're fully staffed up there for now. Obviously, we'll probably continue to grow at some point in the future. Um, and we've really been working around how we organize and focus as part of that growth. And so each PM now has a very distinct area that they own and oversee. So when is focused on our growth initiatives. Malcolm, who's on a, a well-earned vacation today, uh, covers our collaboration stuff, so making uh, researchers successful on the platform as they do research together. Paulo is covering logistics. So when we found you a participant, how do you contact them to schedule them and review their information and do all of that? And then Carol is on matching. So basically, how do we find the right participants for um, a given study? And then we've also added some engineers to the team and we're continuing to hire on engineering and products. So a plug there if you know anyone in your uh, product networks who are talented and would be interested in joining us, um, please send them our way. And then um, less visible for these types of updates, but as we've grown, we are doing a lot to scale, just like the underlying uh, infrastructure and, and the way we do things in terms of making the site more performant, but also making it easier for us to deliver new updates and, and um, pursue new uh, improvements. So again, that's kind of behind the scenes, but part of, um, part of a larger initiative for us is to make sure that we can continue to deliver great experiences and, and we're doing a bunch of things um, to make that possible. So I just wanted to start there. Uh, and then Brittany. Hello all, um, I'm Brittany, product marketer. Uh, my name here is user interviews, but you can call me Brittany instead. <laughs> um, we have done a lot of work on our product roadmap and it is public. We'd love for you to check it out. Kate, you wanna give them a little Yeah. Peek? Cool, so uh, just to go over it, we've updated the launch section. So within all of these cards, you should see what we've recently built, a little blurb about them, and then a link to any assets we've created around those. So if there's a blog post, if there's support guides, stuff like that, um, that will be in that section. And then for building, so these are the topics we're gonna go over later. Um, these are all in progress works. And so these are solutions we've already come up with and the team is um, working hard on right now. So that's a good place to see like kind of what's on the horizon. And then this is where we would really, really love your input. These are bigger opportunities we're considering. So we're kind of early stage on them or we haven't figured out the solution for them yet. And so um, if you click on them, if you'll demonstrate GH, you can actually kind of raise your hand for wanting to be in the conversation about this feature. So um, rating how important it is to you and then giving some initial feedback in your email address. And that way we can um, share that with the PM on the project so that if they do user research, oops, Jim had a question. Do you mind reading that, Tucker? I can't see it right now. Um, um, 
you're just asking if this is visible to everyone. Um, yeah, yeah, so you can just, anyone can go to roadmap.userinterviews.com and you'll have the same exact view. And um, that would be how you get here to what Brittany was just covering. Link link in the chat for all yes. to see. And tomorrow I'm gonna send a email with the recording, um, any related support articles or assets for the features we cover. And I will make sure to link that in the email if you forget, but we would love if you um, helped contribute to um, our research and, and so we can take your feedback into consideration. So, all right. Yeah, um, sorry, yeah, I think there's a little confusion. Uh, the, the link that Tucker gave also should work, but there's sometimes that that loads a little weird. So if you hit the roadmap that user interviews.com, that one should be more reliable. So um, just a heads up. Cool, cool. but uh, hopefully that works for everyone. Uh, all right, so with that, we can get into what has gone out recently. So uh, Brittany, I'll let you run through these. Great. All right, many of you have probably already seen this. So we redid our project builder. So the, the first step to having a project, you got to build it first. So um, a big effort here was on the foundation. So how it, all the components are put on onto the project builder. And so we wanted to make sure that our project builder could could grow and scale and iterate and change and we could run tests and stuff as as the product continues to grow. So um, a good example of that, I just, I'll go ahead and tease it. We're doing previewing skip logic and that is um, made available because we did this um, foundation work. So um, big call out for that. Um, we've also seen a reduced um, amount of researchers trying to launch with errors because we have much better error handling within the project builder, as you can see here. So if you have an error, it's, um, it comes up as a little like exclamation, oh no, um, on that side panel. And then it has um, more descriptive um, error messaging within that page. So helping you just notify errors and fix them before you get to the, to the launch stage. And um, we'll talk a little bit more through this later, but we also have additional refinements coming to the characteristic section of the builder. And that's thanks to a lot of feedback from you. So any any um, questions or additional comments from anyone? Doesn't look like anything here, but we can- um... I'll just say yes. So that is new and um, such a handy, obvious thing to include. So autosave is in the new builder. Yeah, so that's been rolled out for everyone. So uh, we're excited about that and a lot to continue to iterate on, but um, a cool new uh, foundation to do so. Uh, Jim's got a follow up question, team. Saving continue. Oh, yeah. yeah it's um, away. <laughs> yeah, that's largely just because you are like when we, every time we change the page, we are also saving it, uh, prompting a save. So it's, um, there's a couple of different things that trigger save. So uh, I think just in terms of whatever copy we, we came up with on that button was um, just trying to be extra explicit in what was happening. Okay. Next one is for folks who have the document signing add-on. So we added additional functionality there. So um, we got some feedback that people, maybe you didn't add a document to your project when you were building it because you didn't have it yet. Your legal team was still working on it. You just forgot, whatever the case. So now you can ask your PC to add it for you post-launch, whether you have um, confirmed participants or not. And if you do have confirmed participants, you can trigger sending that document to sign. Um, yourself. So um, that's just a little bit more wiggle room when, when you can add a, oh, sorry, project coordinator. <laughs> so the person that from UI that helps you when you write into projects at, um, they will be the one to help you with that. <laughs> yes, Will. Uh, is will. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, or someone, no, it's Will, <laughs> who's great and will absolutely take care of you. Um, yeah, and, and if then, you haven't, I was just gonna say, if you haven't heard of document signing just generally, uh, something we launched um, at the end of last year, but uh, if you need, you know, NDA is kind of like the classic example of you need somebody to sign something before you can speak to them, but we see a lot of other people using it for other consent agreements or other things that they need to do for whatever type of research they're facilitating. So um, that's the feature in a nutshell. And now there's a couple of new um, wrinkles here that, that Brittany's covering. And just to connect the dots, when was the awesome product manager and product designer uh, for this? for this effort. So, uh, and then the other new add to that is you can now download a copy of the document in app. So um, you get a copy in the email after a participant confirms their time slot, but um, you know, emails get lost or deleted or end up in spam folders or what have you. Um, so now you can just download it. 
the project owner or the collab can download it um, in app. And you can even download it once the uh, project has already closed. So if you need to come back later and, and reference that, um, it is still there. Yeah, some very, uh, some very nice iterations on this one. It's been cool to see everyone uh, adopt and use uh, this feature. All right, and for our paid hub subscribers, we have added some new functionality to email themes, which um, came out, I wanna say Q4 of last year and email template sets, which came out, I think Q1 of this year. And so email themes helps um, you brand, make your uh, emails look and feel the way you want, email template sets. Um, so you can save that custom copy that you wanna repurpose over and over. So now you can duplicate and delete uh, both of those. And you can also see here, we've added this last modified column. So that's really nice if you're working on a team and um, it's a lot of hands in, in um, you can make sure you know who um, last updated it. And yeah, just great. So you don't have to start from scratch. You can, you know, if a coworker had a, a theme you really liked, you can duplicate, but make modifications without um, changing what they did. Yeah, a pretty uh, pretty standard, I think, part of mm -hmm. workflows, right? If I know when people send me docs, I'm usually like save a copy so I can <laughs> modify it up. And now you can kind of do the same sort of thing uh, for email themes and, and templates. Awesome. I'm continuing with improved hub functionality as you can now create and activate multiple opt-in forms. So a good use case for that is if you, within your company or um, umbrella, you have multiple brands, multiple product lines, you have different very different personas. Maybe you're um, building your panel from specific different channels and you want to ask those people different questions when they're opting into your panel um, so that you can then later, you know, filter or, or invite based on those, um, those questions and answers that they um, gave you. So, uh, oh, that's good, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> good, glad to hear it. Um, so you'll just activate those and then you can just use those, um, that opt-in form link wherever you want um, to grow your panel um, more flexibly, so. Um, yeah, it's been really cool to see people who are um, like really weave this stuff into their workflow where, you know, through their support teams or other channels, like distribute these links so that as people come up with feedback, they can raise their hand, join in, and then you, you have people that when you need to do research, you're, they're just there for you to reach out to and contact, which is, which is a nice flow to be in. So um, it's cool to, uh, cool to see this evolve. Also, I think we're sharing here that we recently did a study on the responsiveness of folks to join panels via opt-in forms versus CSV upload. And I think roughly folks who via opt-in forms are 5X more likely to respond to invites than folks who've uploaded via CSV. So a great, great reminder of that, the power of the participant opting into your panel knowingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just I think in general, right, if you ever talk to people internally, like, why don't you do enough research? And it's like, people think it takes a long time. If you don't have to go out and find all the people you need to talk to before you can talk to them, because you've been doing that passively over time, it, uh, it saves a lot of that, um, of the headache in that process too. All right. Okay, this and this new. is so fresh, just this morning fresh. So um, we have made the first column. So that's where you see the participant emails here and the header sticky. So if you're scrolling left, as the GIF shows, um, you can keep that, that point of reference of what participant you're looking at that line of data for. And then if you're scrolling horizontally, you don't lose track of um, what column of data you're looking at. So it should make it much easier to, to view all of the participant data in Hub. Uh, and we have a lot more ideas and, and, and plans for that um, in H2 of this year. So this was just like our, our first crack at it. Um, yeah. This yeah. is one, if you've ever, if you've ever used a spreadsheet and you deal with a lot of data, like the first thing you always do is freeze the header row and, and freeze the identifying column. And so uh, we're super excited about being able to do this in the app now. Um, a fun backstory here is when we first were working on Hub years ago to get the first version out, this was something we really wanted to include. Um, we only had like two engineers on the team at the time, and um, we were spinning our wheels on this for a little bit. So we had to set it aside to, to get some of the other stuff out. So um, for me personally, very excited to circle back and see this one at the door. For sure. But um, yeah, and there, we did a lot of research on table functionality in general, in terms of um, usability, best practices, and what could be helpful for people. And so uh, I think we'll have some follow-on updates from here uh, to continue improving this experience, which is uh, exciting as well. 
All right, uh, sweet. Thanks for that, Brittany. I'm gonna um, now just go through stuff that's coming up um, and I'll, uh, I'll probably pass it to the PMs here and there for them to chime in with any additional uh, thoughts from their side. Um, and uh, if you have questions on any of this stuff, feel free to throw it in there and we'll, we'll try to hit it real time. Um, so I think this one came up somewhere else um, in the chat and then um, Brittany, you hinted at it before, but one of the most long requested features we've ever had and obviously something that'll be really useful and, and helpful for lots of folks in, in different applications, but just being able to preview and test your skip logic before you finalize your project. And so now when you're in the builder experience and you're creating a screener, you'll see a very option here to, to preview it. You'll pull up a preview mode that uh, lets you go through it as the participant would, pick answers and the logic will be applied. And then basically a cool part here that I think the team did a really nice job with is when you get to the end, you can just easily go back to the start. Um, and what we heard from researchers is usually there's a lot of paths and different branches of logic that you want to test. And so this makes it easy to run through all of them in one experience and, um, and just hit them kind of one after another. So um, this one should be uh, should be out soon. So when you come back from the long weekend, depending on where you are in the world, as Tucker noted, uh, hopefully uh, soon after that, we'll, uh, we'll have this for you. Um, but Carol, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add on this one or. I also have a question from Jennifer, which I think JG probably partially but I don't know if there's anything else we can share, which is, uh, is UI working on making skip logic more error proof? So obviously being able to preview that logic is, is a really good addition to that, but uh, any other plans to, um, like just, yeah, just make the process of creating skip logic, you know, easier for the researcher. Yeah, I think um, the team did a lot of exploration around some other touches we could do in terms of like surfacing the logic in, in the creation mode in more obvious ways and, and playing around with some of those interactions to make them more intuitive. That's, um, I think, you know, out of the scope of this specific solution, but I think it's one of those things that will continue to be evaluated, but I don't think we have a specific timeline for um, further updates here, but I'm really excited to see how people use and react to this and then we'll factor that into future prioritization. All right. Cool. Yeah, this one should be uh, should be very exciting. We're excited to get this one out. I'm saying exciting a lot. Everything's exciting. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, making it easier for participants to add sessions to their calendar. And so this is actually something we've had for a little bit, but it's kind of um, under the radar um, and only available in certain instances for, for some kind of legacy reasons. But um, Paulo and then the logistics team have been working through uh, making this a lot more obvious and prominent to participants. So when they get confirmed for a project and they sign up for a slot, really easy for them to add the details of that event to their calendar. Uh, the goal here obviously is making sure that they remember to attend the session and, and they're able to you know, connect with the researcher and give them useful feedback. Um, and so this should be you know, in the early side of June as well. Uh, it's coming along nicely. And uh, we're gonna just kind of introduce more places in the participant experience to, to focus this. And then uh, you know, depending on the feedback and, and uh, what we see from participants and how they make use of it, we'll look to kind of further iterate on how we can help uh, them remember their sessions in terms of uh, other calendar options or other types of reminders, things like that. Um, but yeah, Paolo, I know you're doing a lot of exploration here. I don't know if I missed anything. I think you covered it, Rich. All right, cool. So this is going to be exciting. So yeah, hopefully uh, your participants show up more frequently. Um, it is worth noting our no-show rate overall is, is pretty low. So uh, we do a lot already to make sure that participants remember their sessions and we're sending them proactive reminders and things like that. But obviously we know um, anytime a participant doesn't show up when they're planning to, there's a lot of impact there in terms of, you know, you made the time for it, you maybe have different stakeholders involved in the research and, and um, not having that session take place is, is really costly. And so we do a lot to, uh, to make sure they show up and we're going to continue to do more. So uh, oh, there were a couple questions here. Uh, let's see yeah, Kyle is asking, does additional participant calendar functionality provide more flexibility? for participant-driven rescheduling as well? Um, yeah, it's a great question. So uh, this won't, uh, in the immediate term, uh, affect the experience around how participants can propose um, new times or reschedule. Um, that is something that uh, I think we'll continue to look at. So one thing we're really excited about as we grow the team is Paulo and his group uh, is a new group we're standing up around logistics, which a big piece of that is scheduling. And so as that team gets fully staffed up and, and is running full speed, like they're gonna be Pretty much solely focus on these types of problems and so i can't speak to the exact roadmap or prioritization that'll come out of that but um as we identify gaps in the experience um we'll have now a, pa a group of people who are focused on delivering improvements there just day over day week over week whereas before when the team was smaller we've kind of yo-yo people around of let's work on scheduling for a little bit okay now we're going to work on this other thing and so i think um we're really excited about what we're going to be able to do to scheduling 
in, in that part of the workflow holistically, but don't have a specific plan yet on uh, the exact items that we'll invest in next. Yeah, worth mentioning that the first iteration of that participant time suggestion flow, I, um, my uh, memory is that, that that's been overwhelmingly successful and folks being able to find a time that works for both parties. Yeah, yeah. That, that I think what you're referencing is a little different than rescheduling, but in terms of uh, and the initial scheduling, if it doesn't work out, they can propose some times, which I think we can borrow from parts of that experience for, for rescheduling as well. And uh, then Jennifer asks, can participants see the location link? If I add it once, they are already scheduled. Um, so the location link, meaning I assume like a, a Zoom or a Google Meet type link. Um, so they've been scheduled and then you add the link after the fact. Is that is that the question? Yes. Uh, Jennifer says yes. Um, Paulo, I don't know if you have thoughts on, on how that dynamic will work here. Um, I don't. I, why don't I give that to Brittany and she can put it in the notes uh, tomorrow when she follows up. Um, I believe it's a live link, but I want to confirm. Cool. My understanding is if there was a default link in there when the project launched, even if you added a session link after, um, that that's like a variable isn't the right word. But yeah, that it, it will change. Um, yeah, uh, we'll follow on that. It's a great question. Um, uh, cool. All right, and then this is one that when is leading for us, um, but uh, improving the discoverability of studies for participants. So uh, if you've ever been on the participant side of the platform, uh, they have a view of browsing projects to discover ones that they might be interested in and, uh, and can apply to them that way. And we filter it based on what we know about them so that they're projects that they um, should be a good fit for and uh, you know, we don't ask them to apply for things where we don't think they'll qualify. Uh, and then we also send them notifications uh, when we think they're, you know, a really good fit for something to help get it in front of them that way as well. Uh, that experience has honestly been one of the uh, oldest, most underinvested of anywhere in our entire application. And so it's, um, it's, it's very slow and doesn't load super well for participants. Um, it's not very scannable uh, in terms of how you can see the, the key information that might uh, determine whether or not a project is interesting to you in terms of, you know, the format and the incentive and in a little bit of the description stuff like that, it's, it's kind of hard to parse. Um, and as a result, we feel like we don't see as much engagement um, there as we should and as we could. And obviously if participants are browsing more often and identifying studies that are a good fit for them more often, then they're gonna you know, apply to participate in studies and, and there's a lot of virtuous cycles that come out of there. And so you can see here, this is the redesigned uh, experience. And so it's a lot easier to scan. Um, there's a new sort option, which uh, we've heard from participants come up uh, a number of times. We're continuing to ask them to connect their social accounts, uh, which is useful for a bunch of different reasons. And then um, overall, the site should you know, um, load faster for them, uh, be a little bit better at surfacing relevant studies and, and um, all of that good stuff as well. So we're pretty excited about this and um, really hoping that participants will be able to find projects that are exciting for them at a higher clip and, um, and help speed up the process for, for all parties. Cool, it doesn't look like we have questions here, so I'm gonna keep moving. Um, this is another one of the follow-ons we mentioned from uh, the builder improvements. And so we got some good feedback that uh, previously there wasn't this include all option. And it was a little uh, confusing to folks of, if I want, if I don't care um, you know, about a person's gender, I, I'm willing to talk to anyone, how do I do that? And so um, the intent was that you could just leave it blank and then everybody would be included. Um, but what we saw is a lot of people, oops, um, were, were actually selecting all the options um, and just generally, I think, getting confused and making some friction here in the process. Um, so now going forward, there'll be a, a default option of including all. And then when you do go through and deliberately set character, uh, a given characteristic, you can see at a, a very like easy to scan level, which ones you've selected. And so that, you know, oh, right. I did specify that I need people of certain educations, uh, level of education. So if you want to go back and modify that, you know where to do it. Um, and so, uh, hopefully this will be, um, you know, a nice usability win. And then for us, um, there is like a very subtle difference in how we do some of our matching and qualification, depending on whether you check all the options or include all in some cases. And so in addition to the usability win for um, researchers, it also uh, hopefully should make the system a little bit uh, better from a matching perspective um, when people are just leaving it as include all when that's their intent. And so there's a couple of, you know, nice benefits here um, as well. And this will be coming out, um, you know, somewhere in the middle or the back half of June. All right, no questions. People, people seem excited. That's good. Jim and Jennifer competing for most active participant oh, yeah. here. So I guess I was, yeah, I was right to be saying exciting all the time. And then similarly on the participant side of things um, to the update around how they can browse and find studies, also doing some work so that when a new participant signs up, uh, we're intentional about the information we collect from them and uh, the order in which we do it. 
Uh, and so really prioritizing um, the pro professional information since those studies um, can be hard to fill. And so making sure that we always get a job title and company information and things like that from people when they sign up and, and doing that early in the flow is, is really important for us. Um, and then uh, honestly, just we feel pretty strongly that if we can get more participants to give us more useful information on them as they sign up, then we're gonna do a better job matching them for projects, which means researchers are gonna be happier because we found them great people. It means that participants are gonna be happier because into a study that was interesting to them um, and just, you know, the whole system improves. And so this is one of those things where we're pretty excited about it. We're gonna borrow a lot of the patterns from the builder in terms of how we do real-time error messaging um, and give them a sense of how far in the process they are to help um, motivate them to continue finishing it off and, and fill out their profile completely. Um, but uh, it should be, uh, should be a nice improvement. A uh, question from Paul, uh, quoted, great that each respondent comes with ready demographic information. How do we decide which information to include? Are there plans to continuously expand this database, maybe even reliably scaled psychographics? This is a, this is a good question. Um, this is not exactly the same, but uh, Carol, I know you've been doing a lot of exploration in terms of other supplementary data that we might want to collect and organize on participants. I don't know, maybe you want to speak to that a little bit and then we can uh, circle back. Yeah, uh, yeah, we've been spending a fair amount of time recently talking to participants and also getting a sense from researchers about what additional data would be helpful. I think the good news is that participants are happy to share more information if it will better connect them with projects. So we certainly heard that loud and clear. Our first priority is going to be really sort of um, information related to people's work. So what they do for work, what their skills are, et cetera, which will particularly help in finding in professional targeting. So that'll be our first step. But after we do that, I could, um, we might have to sort of like reassess, but I could see us uh, adding additional fields. Certainly interesting to hear that psychographics are something we would use. Yeah, it's super helpful. And we do, um, we do sometimes scan like what are the most common types of questions people are putting on surveys and look for options to maybe pull that in as a, as a more defined field. But um, what we've seen currently is that there's not enough like pattern or signal around um, specific, we haven't, we haven't done that yet, but um, a lot to explore there. All right, um, there was a question um, about uh, the accordion stuff. So let's circle back to this real quick. So um, and Carol, correct me if I'm incorrect here, but uh, my understanding is that include all will be the default value on all characteristics by default. We will not show it over here. And then it only shows you the characteristics that you have uh, explicitly modified. Is that right? Yep, that's exactly right. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, question from Jim about kind of generally how we recruit our panel and, and our intentions there. Um, do we publish a roadmap for your panel recruitment, such as we're looking to add more Latinx users this quarter, that kind of thing, or is panel recruitment more organic project-based and not as planned? Yeah, that's a good question. So this team is largely focused on, you know, the systems that help us uh, onboard and make new participants successful. So like the information we collect from them, how they find studies, how we activate them, that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of how we acquire new participants, that's, uh, that focuses a little bit um, in a couple other teams. So we have an operations team who helps kind of balance the two sides of the market and make sure that supply and demand are, are staying in balance and looking for gaps where maybe we were, that we're light on this audience segment and we need to go out and proactively acquire them. And then the marketing and growth teams uh, do things to you know accelerate that participant acquisition in certain verticals or segments as needed based on some of that uh, marketplace data. So that's where that stuff lives. Um, uh, yeah, so I don't know if that uh, fully covers it. We don't currently publish that. Um, it's something that, you know, depending on like we're seeing what we're seeing in the demand data and what we're seeing in audience retention and, and acquisition, you know, we'll, we'll kind of adjust accordingly from there. Um, but that's, uh, that's more or less how we approach it. We're worth adding to that, that, um... That's an another area that we're investing in post fundraise. And we just um, had Luke join the team. Here's our first uh, individual focus full time on balancing that supply and demand. So he's like literally in, in charge of panel recruitment. And uh, he's only been in a couple of weeks, but he's already making some great impacts there. Yeah. And it, I guess it is worth noting that the, the matching work that Carol's leading um, is, uh, is also like in structuring that data and in, in figuring out you know, where, we're, where we have some gaps. Uh, is also a useful input to those teams working on that problem since they're able to then better identify, oh, this is a project where we struggled to find enough participants. And so what signals can we take away from that in terms of um, our acquisition strategy and, and things like that? Cool. Uh, all right. 
a related question from, from Robert, which is, uh, does UI plan to publish a panel book to give our researchers a better sense of the panel characteristics? Uh, not that I'm aware of. JH, I don't know if that's something that uh, you have any additional knowledge on. Um, it's one of those things that like it's, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what format that would take because it ebbs and flows, right? The panel today is not necessarily the panel that we had yesterday because some people join, some people churn, some people reactivate. Um, so it's it's hard to give like, you know, a static snapshot in terms of, um, we can say roughly, you know, we're very well represented in these markets and in these geographies and, you know, strong in these types of areas. But um, it's one of those things that's so fluid and, and we're always, you know, messing with the incentives in terms of how we keep people in the mix and how we notify them and, and who's um, activated and, and things like that. So uh, I don't know that we could give like one single snapshot, but usually if people reach out and because they have a specific feasibility question or, um, you know, they know they have a very niche need, then we are able to give them like a one-time answer in terms of like, yeah, like that's kind of in our wheelhouse or no, that might be a stretch, but we're happy to try. Um, so if it's, if it's something that we need to do on a one-off basis, we're happy to do it, but we're not planning to publish anything um, broadly around our, uh, our audience. One quick addition to that is um, we're now having our project coordinators review most projects at launch to determine if they'll be challenging or not challenging. Um, it's something that we're testing and I've seen some really neat results from giving researchers indication, you know, at, at launch date of hey, this is going to be a really challenging project for us or not, and asking that researcher for uh, any additional flexibility they may have if it's going to be a challenge. So, you know, the, the ultimate goal here, Robert and others, is um, to, to tell you everything that we know, you know, at launch, whether or not a project is going to fail or not, and, and continue to optimize that process. All right, I'm going to keep moving here and then we'll circle back for questions. Um, this is one I'm going to do at a high level since obviously, um, as we kind of just got to our panel and our matching is a, a big competitive advantage for us. So we're not going to, you know, fully open up the book here on, on all the specifics of what we're doing. But we did just uh, stress that we are putting a lot of effort and, and attention into making our matching systems a lot smarter and uh, quicker so that we can find people um, you know, more effectively and in a, in a faster turnaround, which, you know, something we think we're already pretty good at, but we want to stay, um, you know, as <laughs> on the leading edge there in terms of being a place that you can come to and find participants quickly. Um, and so in terms of what this looks like, just uh, like an illustrative level, we brought in a new system to power um, our matching at kind of an underlying level. We just uh, A-B tested a part of that system and, and saw it work well for us. So, so now we're kind of continuing on the journey. We have another uh, test um, around like how we do the filtering of who's a good fit for something. And then from there, we're gonna look at uh, feeding the system with some improved uh, data, both in terms of um, the additional data we pull into the system, but then also how we structure that data so that it can utilize it better. So there's a couple of things there. Um, and this is something that like, as we have success, we'll roll it out and, and keep iterating. So it won't be something that like overnight we say is done. Um, but just to kind of give you a sense of the investment that's happening here, um, you know, we're going to be able to better utilize responses from past screeners that, that participants have given us. Um, we think we're going to be able to get much faster in terms of like real-time notifications to participants, which will allow us to do a lot of cool new experimental things that we've wanted to do in the past, but haven't been able to just due to the, the slowness of certain parts of the system. And then um, as it's better set up to scale, then we can throw more data into the system to use as matching signals as well. And, um, is it something where we're kind of hitting a limitation on how much data we can process and query against in our current system? So that's something that we're, we're really excited about. And um, yeah, uh, like I said, I'm not gonna <laughs> go into all the specifics here because obviously it's an important part of what we do. Uh, but I think the main piece to hit home is that we should continue to get better at finding you know, niche, hard to find participants and, um, and be faster for projects where uh, you know, maybe they're not as hard to find, but we can, we can deliver them even faster than we do today. Um, and then uh, the last one to hit, just to give a preview, um, is we're really uh, putting some attention in how we support research that happens in larger teams. Um, so our current system, everyone is just kind of in one team. So if you're doing research and you end up with lots of other colleagues in there, you might be seeing uh, projects and, and artifacts that aren't relevant to you because you don't actually work with that person day to day. And then it starts, the whole system gets, starts to become a little cluttered and everyone has access to everything, which, which is uncomfortable for certain teams and certain arrangements. And so the solution we're putting in place here is uh, you'll now have the notion of like an organization. So, you know, the ACME organization is, is the umbrella. And then within there, you can have different teams. So we've mentioned this before, but we made a lot of headway. Um, so you can have, you know, the marketing team, the product team, the design team, or however you organize um, and, and divide your research internally. And 
what this will benefit then is that the team you're on and your teammates will be the people where like that's the group that has access to one another's stuff. So you see your teammates' projects, your teammates see your projects, you can duplicate those projects, you can share and use each other's email themes, all that kind of stuff. Um, people on other teams, it'll be a little bit more siloed, uh, but there'll be some stuff that is shared across the organization. So um, in the case of Hub is a good example. Um, the activity stats are like when somebody last participated in a project or when they were last invited, that will still be org wide um, so that if you're doing, you know, contact rules because you don't want to over contact people uh, for feedback, things like that. Um, you can now manage that in organization level, but uh, have your researchers organized into teams. Um, and then the main thing I think we want to note here is that there's a lot to do on this front. It's a complicated problem and there's a lot of needs uh, across teams and across researchers. And so it's something where we're continuing to do a lot of our own discovery and research to understand um, how we can best help uh, our users. And so if this is where you have this problem um, or you have ideas of what would make your team successful, um, please reach out. Uh, we'd love to talk to people from these larger organizations who have this kind of problem. Um, and, uh, you know, we think there's more we need to do around uh, like how people get into the right teams and, and what permissions they have and all that kind of stuff. So we have some hypotheses, but there's a lot to validate and a lot to explore. Um, but we do have a version that is, is working and, and will be out soon. So if this is something where you think you could uh, benefit and you uh, are down to be an early adopter, uh, please shoot me a note. We'd love to get some people set up here and um, you know, playing around with it and getting their feedback. So um, uh, this will be out, versions of it out soon and we'll start cutting over teams um, on kind of a beta basis for a little bit. And then once we feel like we have the most of the main use cases solved and it's working well for people, then we'll start to scale it up and make it uh, more broadly available. Kyle's got a related question um, around sharing payments within teams. Yeah, well, individual teams within an organization have the ability to apply a single payment option across an entire team, as opposed to the current state, which is tied to individual researchers. Yeah, that's something that I think is definitely under a lot of consideration. I think part of what this solution and why this is kind of like a prerequisite to some of these things is by letting people organize into the teams of the people that they want to have access to their things, then it becomes easier to have like, you know, a credit card that is shared across that group. Whereas our current system, everyone just gets lumped into one uh, team. And so if you put your card up on file and you're sharing it, and then somebody from you know, a different business unit in a different location signs up and is in your team and they start billing projects on your card, um, you know, that, that's been an arrangement that's been a little uncomfortable. And so now that you'll be able to better define the team and say, you know, these six people are the people I work with all the time, it opens up the uh, option for us to start doing some of that shared payment and, and um, other kind of sensitive stuff that uh, we've been hesitant to do in the past. So. Uh, not an exact uh, sense of when we might do something like that, but it's something we've heard quite a bit. Um, and we'd love to reduce that like point of friction for folks. And um, I think it's going to be something that the team that's working in this area, the collaboration team, uh, will definitely be taking a look at. And uh, we'll probably follow up with you for some feedback if, uh, if that's all right. Yeah, that's a great question and an awesome request, Kyle. Um, a question from Paul, which kind of gets to this big, big picture um, concept of participant data. Um, if we go back to the respondent data from prior projects, might we see updated data as time goes on and you ask further questions? So, Yeah, this is a good question. So uh, something we do that um, probably not super well known, but is, is I think hopefully <laughs> clever and useful is uh, the characteristics we collect. Each one of them has what we call a, is um, a grace period. So basically how long do we want to trust this person's answer before we ask them to reconfirm it and make sure that that information is still accurate, right? So if you think about something like level of education, we're not asking people to reconfirm that all the time because you're usually not, you know, graduating from college every month. And so it's not something we need to like keep super fresh. Uh, whereas other characteristic fields, you know, you might, your employment status might change a little bit more frequently, right? And so we have a certain time range we set. And then what happens is when that person goes through and is applying to a new project, we check if any characteristics that need to be updated and we ask them to update them. Uh, the reason I mentioned that is because we use that same sort of system when we introduce a new structured characteristic into the participant pool, which we haven't done in a little while, but we've done in the past. Um, we basically say, like, as they're applying to the project, hey, here's some new information that we haven't collected from this user yet, uh, and let's insert it into that, like, application funnel and have them fill out this, uh, this new characteristic and collect that data, even if it wasn't relevant to the project, just to make sure that we're getting a complete picture on that participant. And so um, to answer the question in a, <laughs> a very roundabout way, uh, we do a lot of things to make sure that we're keeping that participant data up to date. If we do introduce new structured characteristics, we will start collecting it from the existing participant base in the course of them using the platform. And then once we have that data, it will start to show up on, the, on their profiles and be visible. Um, uh, and so if you were to go back to 
um, you know, an old project. And we had now started asking about, you know, the type of car people drive or something. And you're looking at the profile, you would see a field in there that says, you know, what kind of car they have. So. Um, one last question, although uh, great if anyone else can add. Um, this is Daniel uh, in chat. Uh, plans to allow researchers to bypass the review stage for um, time sensitive project. Cool. Yeah, I think the review stage, we should just, um, I don't know how you clarify that exactly, Tucker, but it's like, it's not something that holds up uh, a project. It's more of just a, as the project comes in, one of the project coordinators goes through through it and helps look for, you know, any any errors or things that might be off. So if somebody, you know, made a mistake with the skip logic or whatever, we, we do have people who try to catch that earlier rather than later. Um, Carol, I think you have a ghost behind you. Um, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> The, uh, but the, the project is still live and discoverable for participants. So participants will see it and start applying and stuff. And so the, the review step is really just to make sure that before we really like turn up the dial and get lots of participants to apply to it um, and start pushing out notifications that somebody has just gone through it and made sure it looks good. But I think most of the time that happens very quickly and it doesn't really impede us. It's more of if we do find stuff where the pro they're asking for a very niche, um, you know, high earning professional set of participants and they're offering like a five dollar incentive and they and they have a 50 question long screener survey like that's a situation where we do want to get ahead of that project so that we don't ask participants to you know take a very difficult arduous survey from a very you know important segment of our audience uh for a very low incentive and things like that so it's more to catch those outliers than it is to slow up the average project but um uh, i don't know does that seem like a fair summary tucker i think that's great yep uh, any other questions all? We're uh, exactly one minute over a lot of time. Uh, Brittany, do not put up your head when we'll be doing PT3. Ooh, um, let me look real quick. When is it on my calendar? It will be another Thursday. Thursday feels good. Um, <laughs> it will be, I think, August. August 26th. It's August 26th. Same time, same place. We'll, um, yeah, and I'll send the recording out and all of that. Um, so thanks all for attending. Yeah, this is wonderful. Thanks all for the questions. Um, Jim and Jennifer, gold stars all around. Mm -hmm. uh, but thanks all for your participation and, and the great feedback. We appreciate it. Cool. Yeah, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll probably follow up with a couple of you on some, uh, some stuff that we have questions about. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.